Um, I'm here to speak to you this morning about uh, finding your voice and more importantly, finding your inner voice and how that related to my personal story within the GAA, how I found my voice, how I was able to stand up within the GAA and speak on behalf of the LGBT community and the obstacles that were placed uh, in my way so that you might get some understanding of what it's like to stand up in a hierarchical or organization and uh, try and change things, particularly within the LGBT community. So when I started researching um, this speech, what I came to realize was that finding your voice, or at least my inner voice, um, it's not of my own making. Because what I found out is that we don't actually create our inner voice. We only create the conditions where she can appear. And if you just think about that for a moment, we, we don't create our inner voice. We only create the conditions where she can appear. And if that's the case, you're probably asking, well, how is your inner voice created? And I'm going to talk to you a little about how I came to realization how my inner voice was created and how I created the conditions where she could appear. And I was back in 2007, I was sitting in a lecture hall in, two, in uh, a Gaelic Games elective in, in, in leadership, and the great hurling coach, Paddy Butler, was giving a talk about archetypes. And he was trying to tell us that we had been layered as human beings um, throughout our whole lives. And the way he put this across to us was he told the story of his grandmother's brass bed that had been handed down as a family heirloom over a number of years to his grandmother, his mother, and eventually himself. And as time had passed, that that brass bed had been lacquered or layered or painted uh, each year or each time it had been passed from generation to generation. And when it came to him, he took out a two euro coin and began to chip away at the paint on the bed. And over a number of months, having taken off seven layers of paint, he got the brass bed back to its initial beauty, I suppose. And what was being so magnificently explained to us was that just like the bed, we as young people had been layered or lacquered as a person. By going through years of being told the type of person we are expected to be, and each layer contributed to our archetype. So when I thought about it, I kind of looked at the church, the primary school, uh, my family, and the GAA. And what I realized was, on reflection, that each of those pillars of support for me within my life had layered me as a human being. The family was a very traditional Catholic Irish family. We were taught never to wash our dirty clothes in public, um, and all our problems were to be kept to ourselves. Um, education, I had gone through a typical Irish uh, young child's education, a Catholic primary school, secondary school, and on to become uh, a primary school teacher in third level. The GAA, um, I, I had played from a very young age, uh, from the age of seven, and played right the way through primary school, secondary school, and at every level within the club, right up to senior. And the church, like many people sitting here, I was baptized, uh, made my communion, was an altar server, a uh, confirmation, read at mass for almost 10 years after making my confirmation um, before I moved to college and, and, and put an end to, to, to my visits to the church uh, on Sunday mornings in Slane. But what happens to, to you as a person uh, when all these air, um, layers and archetypes don't actually happily coexist with your inner voice? And I spent the best part of four years grappling with that conflict and trying to come to terms with it. And if you can imagine that horrible fear that you have, that at its very core, there's a disgust or an animosity within those supports for anyone who's gay or homosexual. My family had never met anyone who was gay. There was no gays, certainly, that we didn't know growing up in Slain. I don't need to tell anyone what the church's teachings were on homosexuality. It was illegal for me at the time to be a primary school teacher in my school in Terra Neura because I contravened the Catholic ethos of the school. This has just changed in 2016. And of course, apart from Donal Ogue, there was nobody openly out and gay within the GA, so I had no role models. It's an incredibly difficult time, and that's where my inner voice was created. And the problem was, well, how does she appear? And I, of course, I don't do things small. 
I had two comings out. I had one very private coming out in 2011 and a very public one that I'm going to speak to you about this morning in 2015. And it was the conditions around that coming out in 2015 that allowed my inner voice to appear. And I didn't realize it at the time. I didn't realize it until we had access to a sports psychologist inside in Crow Park who was preparing us for games, All-Ireland semi-finals and finals. And he spoke to me at length about leadership, leadership on the field and off the field. And he used the word revelation to me. He said, it's a revelation what you did back in 2015. And that word struck me because I had never heard it being used in anything related to me before. I'd studied Latin in St. Pat's and Navan um, when I was there as a, as a student. And the word revelation comes from revelare, to veil again. And it struck me about my inner voice, what I had learned back with Paddy Butler in 2007, that 2015 was an opportunity where I unveiled my inner voice and it was veiled again. And that was what created the conditions for her to be heard. And it was a frightening time. Standing up against an organization like the GA was not easy. It all happened around March 2015. I was traveling to a game down in Kildare and I was listening to Leo Varadkar coming out on the Miriam O'Callaghan show on a Sunday morning. And I thought to myself, if the future leader of the country is able to come out and speak about his sexuality, surely the conditions are safe now with the upcoming referendum where I can speak about mine. <clears throat> and the opportunity presented itself a couple of weeks later when I was appointed to referee Tyrone and Dublin in a live match on Sky Sports inside in Croke Park. And I picked up the phone and rang the national match officials manager and told him that I was going to wear a rainbow wristband to call for support uh, to carry the vote at the referendum that was upcoming. And at the time, he said, there was no problem. I had to contact my board of management in the school because officially then it would be common knowledge that I was gay and I would be working illegally inside a Catholic ethos school and could have been fired from my position. That's an awful conversation to have with people who are in control of your livelihood. It's frightening. I was very fortunate that the former CMO, Dr. Tony Holohan, was chairman of my board of management. And he said, David, no problem here at all. Go ahead, we'll support you. Your job is safe. I then had to tell uh, my umpires and families that this something very secret that they had known about me for the previous four years was going to end up in the public domain. And they said, even though that they weren't happy about that, that they'd support me. And as the week went on, I had contacted uh, my local club chairman, who was the sports editor of the Sunday Independent, to tell him that this was going to happen. And he said, hang on, I'll call you back in 10 minutes. And about an hour later, having picked up the phone seemingly to various number of people in the GA hierarchy, he got back to me and said, don't do it. This is not going to end well. This will finish your refereeing career and you'll never referee an All-Ireland final. Luckily, I knew I had the support of a lot of friends within the LGBT community who had said that this move would help carry the referendum maybe in parts of the country where it had not been discussed before. Because the wonderful thing about the GA is it permeates every level of Irish society, irrespective of gender, class, sexuality, or race. And I said to John at the time, John, I'm not asking for permission to do this. I'm asking, do you want the story? And he said, okay. And on the Thursday before the game, the story was written and the photographs were taken. But at that stage, the story had started to trickle out and it had moved from the national match officials manager through the, powers, the corridors of power inside in Croke Park, where it eventually landed on the president and Ard Stewart's desk. And I was woken Saturday morning of the game at 7.30 with a phone call from the communications department in Croke Park saying, David, you can wear the wristband in the dressing room, but you can't wear it outside the dressing room. I said, God, Alan, I said, that's not going to go down too well. Uh, I don't agree with that. We finished the conversation, and about 20 minutes later, the phone rang again. 
will allow you to wear the wristband from the dressing room out through the tunnel to the edge of the pitch, but you can't step across the white line until you take it off. I said, Alan, I can't do that. What sort of signal or message is that going to give? The third phone call just before nine o'clock. David, you can't wear the wristband whatsoever. You're a referee within our association. And if you can't uphold the rules of our association, how can you go out on the pitch and ask others to uphold them under your guidance? I said, that's fine. You can deal with the fallout from this. I have a match to referee. I won't wear the wristband, but the story is written. And it was agreed with the Sunday Independent that the story wouldn't go out until after I threw up the ball at seven o'clock. And the story was released at seven o'clock and I refereed the match. And what I didn't realize was that what had been agreed to be a very small story about a positive message inside in Crow Park, which was supposed to be in the sports section of the Sunday Independent, ended up on the front page of the main newspaper. And that again is a frightening scenario. And it passed, and I did a couple of media interviews in the week following. And the GA then stood in, from refereeing inside in Crow Park, Division One, two best teams in the country, live on Sky Sports. I was sent down to Cashland Tipperary, to this day the lowest ever ranked game I've refereed, in a club ground, not even a county ground. And the head of the appointments committee rang me and said, we'll dictate your matches, we'll decide where you go, we don't ever want to see that wristband again, put it away, don't let it see the light of day, and if you want to continue refereeing, that's what's going to happen. And that's quite a firing shot to come from the GAA. I was very young, only starting off my refereeing career, and it took almost 18 months to get back in to referee a senior inter-county game in Croke Park again. And I had learned my lesson. The wristband stayed hidden. It didn't come out, and my sexuality was never mentioned again for four more years. Now you can imagine in a hierarchical, male-dominated GAA institution, it is very hard to bring up anything around sexuality. Only last year, the first ever female was put on to the management committee inside in Croke Park. So you can see what I was up against. In a chance meeting, in December of 2018 with Valerie Mulcahy, Cork's 10-time All-Ireland winner, we met at an LGBT radio interview uh, with Off the Ball and had a coffee afterwards. And Valerie said to me, look, David, we need to bring this back to the GA. It's time to move on. The referendum has passed. If the GA truly is representative of grassroots around the country, surely at the highest level, it has changed as well and I'll bring the whole weight of support of the LGFA behind me. Luckily, the one good thing about the GA is its hierarchy changes every three years with an incoming president and newly appointed people on each committee. And we knew John Horan, and we sat down and met him in January 2019 and asked him for three things. Could we fly a pride flag in Croke Park? Absolutely not. It can't be done. Uh, it's the Leinster Hurling weekend, and it won't happen. Just last month, they passed hidden legislation within the GA only to fly GA and Croke Park and county flags inside the stadium. For Pride this year, they flew the Pride flag outside the stadium on the museum, but never inside. We asked him, could we get a message on the screen to support LGBT members within the GA? And he said, no, it's a Leinster Council gig. Uh, we can't do that. And I looked at Valerie, and she said, well, John, we've one more thing to ask. Can we at least walk in pride? And he sat there, and he's a secondary school principal, and he said, leave it with me. John now talks about that moment when Valerie and I left his office, arm in arm, as he watched our backs leave his presidential office inside in Croke Park. And he says, at that time, we looked like any, and I hate this word, normal couple, leaving his office. And he realized then that we were two 
very different people who were struggling because of our sexuality within the association. And he made a presidential decision at that time. This is key. He made the decision. It has never been passed or ratified by any board or committee or management committee inside in Croke Park to allow us to walk in the GA in 2019. And it was a turning point. It was a massive turning point within the GA because finally there was acceptance of who we were as people. And I can remember that June morning where we gathered outside the Cusack stand to walk in pride. And the GA had paid celebrities from around the country to come and walk in pride because they were afraid of the small numbers of people that would show up. And with Catherine Lynch, uh, Michal Omar Hertig arrived for a while, Joe Brawley, and what can only be described as something that you'd see on the local slain St. Patrick's Day parade, marched from Croke Park up to Parnell Square to walk in the Dublin parade. There was no money put into it, and we were only allowed carry flags that the GA had in the storeroom underneath. There was nothing with pride colours. But it was a defining moment for the LGBT community in the, in, 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 in the GA, because we completed the walk in the Pride Parade. And slowly but surely, John Horan saw sense. And things started to change within the GA. Immediately, a diversity and inclusion work group was set up to look at gender identity. The GA were the first ever non-governing sporting body in the country to appoint a diversity and inclusion officer. And she is still there to this day. The GPA have now come on board and taken over the mantle and held a Pride brunch for the first time ever this year in Dublin, which was massively attended by female and male athletes, straight, gay, and their allies, which was a huge moment for those within the GAA who are part of our community to see so many allies turn up to something that we never thought they would. And over the last two years, two separate clubs, one in Belfast, Erica Ulla, and one in Dublin, Nagail Erica, the Rainbow Gales, have been set up as LGBT inclusive clubs within the GA to rival even the greatest of LGBT clubs within the capital, and they are thriving. And the GA was very worried about the setting up of Nagail Erica. It took a long time for Dublin County Board to allow them to register because they were worried about the um, potential of referee match reports arriving in with reports of uh, homophobic language. But what Dublin County Board didn't realise was that this was a social outlet for members of the LGBT community, a social outlet where they could meet and train together, go for a drink after training with their friends, discuss matches from the weekend, or go to matches all around the country. And the GA has taken huge strides, but only because they're starting to create an environment that is safe and welcoming for members of the LGBT community. Most of you might work in corporations that are concentric. That means that there's someone at the middle and a team all around them. And you feed back into team leaders and there's feedback and it goes in every direction. It's almost like a spider web. Probably the best type of organization to have if you're running big, big corporations. However, the GA is hierarchical and it has a very clear leadership structure from the top down to the bottom. And for a number of years, it never felt that it could create the space for people to come out within, within their ranks. Inside in Croke Park, it is split into two separate entities, the GA itself and the people who run the stadium. And for the first time ever, we are starting to see people come out inside the walls of Croke Park and be who they are within the GAA. I can tell you, John Horan's permission that was given to me and to Valerie in 2019 brought about a lot of self-acceptance. And from self-acceptance comes great self-confidence. If you take any message away from this talk this morning, that self-acceptance breeds great self-confidence. And I'm testament to that, and I can honestly say that when I was given the opportunity to referee the All-Ireland Final in 2019, I performed at the highest level ever within my refereeing career. 
not because I was any better than I was the year after or any less than I am now, but because of the self-confidence that I got a couple of months beforehand by self-acceptance and acceptance within the association. And for many of you that are working in businesses out there, you don't know what way anyone is coming to work in the morning. You don't know what mindset they're coming in, what they're leaving behind, what baggage they're carrying with them, not only in relation to sexuality, but many other facets of life. My challenge to you is to create that environment for the people in your work, to allow them to bring them full selves to work and to be exactly who they are, to help them with their self-acceptance and to give them the self-confidence to work as best that they can be and to create the environments where they feel safe, welcomed and trusted. And it's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing to create those environments. They're not easy conversations sometimes to have. Often when I go to businesses and I ask, they ask about, you know, what can we do for Pride Week? And they try to make a big deal out of Pride Week. And I'm saying, but well, what are the conditions you create in here, week in, week out, to allow your staff be themselves and be happy about being part of the LGBT community? Can they talk openly about their sexuality, where they were at the weekend, what they did, or who their partner is? Are those discreet conversations had at the water cooler? Or are you afraid because you might know that they're gay and you're afraid what they might tell you? Or maybe you don't know the language and are frightened to ask. And it's education. It is, revolves around education. If we can educate people to create these environments, to help them understand the language, to help them understand the difficulties that we face, and the obstacles that are put in front of us, well, slowly, things will start to change, just like they started to change in the GAA. And for any allies that are out there, it's a call also to you to stand up by our sides. Belong to have a lovely slogan that they use for Stand Up Week, um, where when everyone comes into our world, nobody needs to come out and not to be bystanders in relation to uh, homophobic or transphobic language, but to be upstanders and to call it out for what it is and to create that safe and inclusive environment. Finally now, at 38 years of age, I'm living a full life as a human being within the GA. That's very sad that it took 38 years for that to happen. And that for the best part of my youth, I had to hide who I was, what I believed in, and what my sexuality was. But slowly, through change, education, visibility, and these types of talks, the environment is changing. Workplace is a safer and more inclusive environment and I hope that continues. Are we finished yet? Not close to it. There's a long way to go, and there's a long way to go still within the GA, but we will get there. I'd like to wish you all the very best of luck over the coming week, and thanks for having me.